Gracious Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we're so grateful, so honored, Lord, that we can just open your word up, dig into it, just with open hearts and open minds, Lord, so teachable and ready. Lord, I thank you for each one here, Lord, and those that can't be with the pray for Daryl, that his healing will continue on and he'll be uh, up and, and running <laughs> in no time at all. I pray for Michael Johnson. He's usually with us, Lord, and I'm, I'm always concerned when he doesn't show up. And I, I pray for Doug, Lord, that you would just put a mighty touch of the great physician on his knee and heal him and, and get him back to 100% soon so that he can do, uh, you know, just serve the Lord with everything he's got. So give we give this time to you, Lord, that you might be glorified in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. So I guess uh, you may have seen, uh, obviously, on Facebook, the announcement for this. So you know that uh, we're talking about counting the costs. Uh, no doubt about it, but it's uh, <laughs> now this is a strong one. You, you guys know it's it's like the Lord uses me for some of these strong things, and I am like that watchman on the hill. You know, I'm like, hey, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. And we have uh, I, I I I refer to cheap grace. It may not be a very respectful sounding way to put it, but uh, you know, where we just cling to the cross, we cling to all the good stuff, and we just can't imagine that, uh, you know, we've got a cross around our neck and a bumper sticker. Of course, everything's good in our life spiritually, uh, but have we ever really cost, uh, looked at the cost of being a disciple, follower of Jesus? You know, in this the world today, so many people are willing to pay a price, aren't they? You know, they'll pay a price for their belief system. We see it out there. This is not meant to be a political by any means, but you know, you see major corporations. Listen, these corporations know that when they take a stand, or uh, you know, or for the alphabet, they're going to take a hit, and and they really don't seem to care whether it's millions or billions. Doesn't matter. They'll figure they'll bounce back because it's important enough to them to take that stand, even if it costs them big time, right? They, so many people are willing to pay the price. What we see out in the world today equates to less than uh, one half of one percent of our entire population. Population, but it's he who's making that noise, right? He who's saying, I'm willing to stand. Imagine if you could take all that energy and all that passion and all that commitment, and it's so Jesus instead of the alphabet. Can you even imagine? You know, so are you willing to pay the price uh, for your belief system? Are you willing to pay it? Because the bottom line is this uh, it's you got the greatest gift known to mankind. There's nothing like the free gift of salvation. We could not have purchased it. There was nothing we could do, uh, you know, to earn it, if you will. He paid the price, but, you know, it's going to cost you everything. And so I want to take a look at that with you guys tonight. You know, it's one thing to, to be here. It's one thing for people to be gathered in a church. It's, it's you know, it, it's one thing to do a Bible study. It's another thing to be in Christ. And so as we consider that free gift that we've been given, the, the blood of Jesus Christ, it's time to look at the cost. It's time to look at the journey. So nobody gets caught by surprise, okay? It's time to take a very, very close look at that narrow gate. We hear about the narrow gate. We read about the narrow gate. We talk about the narrow gate. But do we really consider that? Is there a possibility that I may not be going through that gate? Is it possible that the churches have, have quit uh, on the tough messages and people don't understand these kind of have this fluffy faith and they don't understand that, uh, you know, there's more to it than that. But God did take our sins and he transferred them to the innocent lamb and, and, and he bore our sins uh, you know, in his body. His father crushed him, you know, and at the end of it, he said, it is finished. But, you know, again, it, it's going to cost us everything for our faith. So it's possible that some people, uh, you know, in our little gathering this morning, on this little gathering tonight, for people tuning in for, via YouTube later on, it's possible that some people are saved and, and <laughs> they really are. They think they are, but they aren't. I mean, you know, so unless people tell us, right, how are we supposed to know um, any otherwise? unless we, somebody actually tells us uh, the difference. And so it's possible. So my heart is always to, um, you know, be able to talk to people, give them the full scoop of things, how it really works, and, and be sure that they know. So the fact of the matter is there's a possibility that it's people, maybe it's you, maybe it's someone you love, maybe it's somebody you're married to, maybe it's one of your children, and they have never really done business with God. And so maybe they've never come to that intersection in life where they have to say, I'm going to surrender or not, right? I'm going to, I'm going to be, be one of his or not. And it's only when we do that we're able to receive that gift. And so we're going to be looking at scripture tonight. I'm getting into the main scripture in just a second, but Matthew 7, 13 says, enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate 
and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And again, uh, you know, in these days, the enemy is... Um, he knows his time is up almost, right? He knows his days are numbered. And so he's raging and raging and raging. He loves that when pe- when uh, professed Christians are deceived and they don't know. He loves sitting there thinking that the churches aren't, so, aren't, aren't speaking the truth as much as they should, right? He loves that. He would love to think that a lot of us uh, will you know, find our way in hell. We thought we were going to heaven. Our main scripture tonight is coming from Luke and it's Luke 14, uh, beginning in verse 25. And it's the cost of being a disciple. So in uh, verse 25, it says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to him, to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and you're not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying that person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. Doesn't say some things or the hard things or the sinful things. It basically says everything. So let's look at what a disciple is, because I think sometimes it's that uh, very uh, you know misunderstanding, if you will, that the disciples in our world are the are the preachers and the and the evangelists and the missionaries. So we need to break it down. So the Greek term for disciple in the New Testament is methetus, which actually basically means student or learner. So here we are. We're all on here together to learn. We're all students. We're all learners, right? But a disciple is also a follower, someone who adheres, you know, completely to the teachings of another, making them his rule of life and conduct, if you will. So Jesus' followers were called disciples long before they were ever called Christians. In fact, we don't see a reference to Christian, the the, the phrase Christian or the title Christian, uh, until Acts, I think it's Acts 11. We don't see it there until then, right? And, and, and when it is, the theologians say it was kind of a derogatory reference, you know, oh, you, it, it means Christ, uh, little Christ, you know, you little Christ, you know, so uh, that's what they believe, that it was uh, derogatory. So when we look at it, disciple really is who we are. That's who you are. That's who I am. And so everything, every reference here that we read in the Bible, if you, if not this, you can't be my disciple. If not that, it refers to you and to me. It's not some higher hierarchy out there. It began, but you know, it starts with us. So let's start. Let's break it down a little bit. So large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them. He said, and "We don't know how many, but again, theologians think thousands." Uh, why? Well, because thousands gathered, even, you know, we fed 5,000 uh, plus women and children, and his following was growing and growing and growing. And so a uh, large crowd, listen, Jesus is not impressed by large crowds. He didn't care how big your church is. He doesn't care if you got a 3,000 uh, person sanctuary. It doesn't matter. He, he he looks at the smaller groups. He's looking at the heart, right? So he could care less. He's not impressed by that. And it looks like he thought, you know, well, this is like crowd, uh, you know, a frenzy, if you will, where people just going along for the crowd. And you know what? We do that too. We think, wow, you know, something good going on over there because a whole bunch of people there. Uh, the reference I gave in uh, the well this morning was if you saw people lined up for a restaurant, what would you do? You'd say, you know what? We need to go there because clearly that's a good place. We like to follow people. Remember, we're sheep, right? So we see we see a bunch of people and we start following. Same is true, of course, you know, uh, with the faith where, you know, sometimes it's an emotional following and, uh, you know, I think that's what he was addressing is thousands of people, you know, following along. And it's almost like he thought, I need to sift through this. He can see, you know, and you, you, I said this morning, you guys have heard me say before, it would be troubling for lack of a better word. If we could put on like 3D glasses and look inside of any church in America and, and be able to see who's saved and who's not, it would be very very troubling. And so Jesus can see it all. He's looking at this massive crowd and it's almost like he's thinking, I got to sift through this and they need to understand exactly 
what it looks like to follow me. So turning to them, uh, he said, you know, he's pausing, he's stopping. You know, don't you wish churches would do that? Time out, we need to talk, right? It would be so beautiful if they would do that. But so he turned to them. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, this has been twisted six ways from Sunday, this scripture. You know, people, uh, non-believers will challenge and say, what is that? You know, your God's all love? Yeah, right. He wants you to hate your family. It's not what this is. What he's trying to say is, listen, if, you, if anybody comes to me and doesn't love me most of all, if I'm not first and foremost, if I'm not the uh, most important thing in their lives, you know, if that's not the way it is for them, excuse me, Michael Johnson calling. He's forgetting what time it is. So if they don't know, you know, that if you're not, I'm number one in your life, you know what? You can't be my disciple. We see it a lot, don't we? See it in relationships. Oh my goodness. I just want to scream when I hear people say, Boy, you know, when I visit my family, I can't talk about Jesus because they said, you know, they get sick of hearing it and they won't let me come if I'm going to. Well, then don't go. OK, so if he's not number one in your life, remember in the Bible, when he was talking about, you know, on, no honor in your hometown, he says, kick the dust off your feet. And those are what he was referring to people in their hometown. So the bottom line is nobody, your children, your parents, your sisters, anybody in your life can even come close to being uh, in your heart who he is or you're not a disciple that's the bottom line if that's not who he is you cannot be my disciple listen why would he put up with that you know if you had somebody that in your life that said well i don't know if i have time for you got something better to do today but you know i'll, I'll check in with you next week and, and and maybe we can talk and i'll give you a little piece of my life are you kidding me why would he put up with that you wouldn't put up with that in a in a worldly or a flesh relationship in a marriage or whatever he wouldn't put up with that. So why would he put up with that? So he's saying, no, I'm number one. And if you want to be a disciple, I died for the disciples, by the way, you want to be a disciple, you know, then, then you have to, I have to be above all, everybody else, everything else in your life. And then he says in verse 27, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So the carry the cross thing is it's kind of a double meaning, but here in uh, Luke 14, what it's referring to is, you know, when when Jesus carried his cross, it was a it was symbolic of he was under the authority, right? He 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 had surrendered to the authority of the government at that point, and he's carrying his cross, you know, to Calvary. And that's really what this is saying as well. Listen, you 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 need to surrender everything, right? So you you need to submit to my authority. You need to. I need to see you surrendered to my authority. Carry your cross, carry your faith, get out there and, and surrender to my authority. So unless you can do that, you can't be his disciple. It's a little scary as the, the gate you know, starts narrowing. And then it says, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. He didn't say some things, most important things, the bad things. He says everything, surrendering everything to him. Why? Because everything belongs to him. And so it's a tough thing to do. But, you know, for those of us who love him, that's what we want to do. We want him to be in the driver's seat. We want him to be ahead of our homes. We want him to uh, be ahead of our children. We want him, you know, to do these things. I remember, you know, so long ago, you guys have heard me repeat myself, unfortunately, but you know, I remember taking a class. I was a, a baby Christian, and I remember taking this class on covenant. And it was a K. Arthur precept class. And and I, I can remember this saying, take a take us a, a pen or something and mark in your hand what it is you're holding back from God. What are you refusing to let Him have? And for me, I didn't have to think about it. I knew I, He wasn't getting my babies, right? Because I could I couldn't imagine anything anybody loving them as much as I love them. And so, you know, I, I, I would not give up everything until that moment and finally gave it all to him. So unless we're willing to do those things and give it up, give everything to him. So in, in summary, again, what is he saying? Oh, unless I'm first and foremost, unless I'm above all by, by eons, right? And unless you give up everything, unless you're willing to carry that, carry that cross, you cannot be my disciples. Listen, Christ died and he died for the sins of the world, right? 
but it that only applies if you believe in him if you surrender to if you become a disciple so really you could look at it and say he died for the disciples that you know his blood covers the disciples because the non-believers they have a chance but unless they become a disciple that blood doesn't cover their sin they haven't ever surrendered it they haven't repented right and so <laughs> we have to take this you know super seriously and look at who are we if we're disciples all these things do apply it's not quite as simple as saying well i you know went forward in my church and i got baptized and i sit on the second pew every sunday it's not that simple and so he wants just like you want in your life you want loyalty you want uh you know anybody in your life from your children to your mate right you want that loyalty you want them do you want to know that you're first and foremost important well why would he want any less so he's saying this is what it takes when he turned around to that crowd and said, hold on a second, I'm going to sift through this stuff. And, and he told them what it would take to be a disciple. And I'm sure that thinned it out. So there's a big difference, again, between uh, being a, a true disciple of Jesus and someone who just attends church. You know, you guys see it, I'm sure, when you go to your church and there's some people just there. to It feels good, okay? <laughs> You're around good people and you know, it's usually great fellowship and, and it's a feel good time. But, you know, a lot of people are just attending church. So every true Christian, uh, every born again believer is a disciple of Jesus Christ. So you have been ranked up. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ. And there's a cost. So Jesus said, uh, you know, in a, in a lot of simple illustrations to make this point. And of course, you can see it repeatedly quickly put an end to the idea that he's some kind of welfare program. No, you're not going to just ride the wave of Jesus <laughs> without counting the cost. It's not going to happen. And so he's putting an end to it through some of the references of scripture. So although that gift of eternal life, it, it's free. Again, we can't go buy it. We, it it's, we don't deserve it. That's what grace looks like, right? To anybody who asks, anybody who surrenders, of course, we see that in John 3, 16. You know, um, but bottom line is, uh, you know, it requires a transfer of ownership. In other words, uh, you know, I, I am my own person. I did it my way, all that stuff. We come to know Jesus. We transfer it all. Lord, it's yours. Everything I am, everything I have, everybody, it's all, it all belongs to you. And so it's a transfer of ownership. We see that in Luke 9, 23. And he says to all, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. Again, take up his cross daily and follow me. So that daily thing is, it, it's, listen, it's not a uh, get your ticket punch once and you're good to go. It's a it's a daily thing to work on your relationship with Christ. So it is a, a choice to pick that cross up every single day. So, you know, he's basically saying, you know, let him deny himself, take his cross up and follow me. When Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And so counting the cost, you know, means that we recognize and agree to terms. You know, he has set some terms. And I don't know why we don't like talking about that. I don't believe you can lose your salvation, by the way, but I do believe that it's 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 a little deeper. And there are little, you know, if you see no fruit in a person's life, if you don't see that kind of thing, the chances are they're not a true disciple, right? So in following Christ, we can't simply, you know, follow what we want to do and and then say, well, it's good. It's going to be okay. I can just ask God to forgive me tomorrow. And, you know, the more, uh, the closer we become, the more we learn, the more we follow, the more we want to please. And so it is not a lifelong of the, all this mess that some people, you know, attempt to justify. And Matthew 7, 13, 14, following him may mean we lose relationships, uh, dreams, material things, our lives. So, the $64 question is, are you a follower? Are you a disciple? Have you given all that stuff up? You know, some of us uh, are in a, a financial world. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, how God looks at money, you know, and it really, uh, the blessings in your life, and this isn't a prosperity uh, gospel, it's not what I'm saying, but it, it's releasing, being so grateful for what you have and releasing the control and power of your money to him, right? It's his, it, it, it all belongs to him. And when you see that, you know, you can see, or experience that, you, you can see that uh, the blessings from it, right? So the $64 question is, are we a follower? So Jesus was explicit about following the, and the cost to follow him. So discipleship requires that totally committed life. You know, you anybody can remember you know, when you were younger, maybe being in love and that commitment you thought you were making, right? And, and, and his word says, any of you who does not give up everything, remember, 
he cannot be my disciple. And so sacrifice is expected. He says it in several places. It, you, God's word is <laughs> it's non negotiable, right? He set the terms. And Jesus said to disciples again, if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So it, this life is not about what makes us feel good, okay? If we're loving Jesus the way we're supposed to in our hearts, right? It, everything feels good. But, you know, a rainstorm is beautiful. Anything's beautiful, right? And so we, you know, but it's it's surrendering that. And that means that's what it looks like every day to take up your Christ, your cross. So the one who issues the call sets the terms. And we're not allowed to negotiate those terms. How many people you see negotiating those terms? You know, again, when we go through this, what I, I, I with all due respect, when I say cheap grace, you know, where we just can, some people just have a perpetual sin thing going on. Same sin, same sin. Say, oh, he'll forgive. Oh, he'll forgive. Lather, rinse, repeat. So that's a good sign that, you know, they have not surrendered to that. They don't understand what it looks like, you know, to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple. And it means that you're in that perpetual learning student mode. You want to learn more and you want to be more. So you're in his word. You hunger for his word as a deer pants for water, right? And you follow him. And so there are other things with that. So again, what Christ says in verse 26 and 27, they are non-negotiable terms. It's not like you can take one little piece of this part of the Bible and say, well, he didn't really mean that. No, he says it in different ways. Take up your cross and, you know, uh, die to yourself. I'm number one. So they're fixed and they can't be altered. They're the same for every single one of us. So he never tried to you know, be Mr. Popularity. Uh, we talk about soft selling the gospel, you know, in churches where pastors are afraid to, you know, uh, you know, mention, you know, hell, sin, money, because they don't want people to leave it. They want those crowds. It's like they judge their success in the kingdom of God by how many people show up. Well, Jesus didn't do that. He, you know, he didn't try to induce that crowd. He, he never tried to manipulate anybody's decision. He never sugarcoated a thing. He spoke with love and compassion and gentleness, but he didn't sugarcoat it. So he never kept the, the hard part out in the fine print, like the churches do, right? Uh, where he couldn't locate it. He never did that. Jesus never softened the requirement to be a disciple. Narrow is the gate. Narrow is the gate. Narrow is the gate. So he never marked down the price for anybody following. So every one of us today needs to do this some serious soul searching. Listen, I don't care. We, you know, I believe the time is near. And all I can say is it's nearer today than it was yesterday. I don't know when it is. Nobody knows it, you know, <laughs> when it is. And so it, it's not that kind of thing. But I believe that it's near. Uh, if it's not near, I believe life is but a vapor. Just like the word says, you could be here tonight and by midnight you're gone. You don't know. These things need to be reckoned with. So if you're not living that way, right, then you need to, you know, have that moment with God, you know, where you can uh, make things right and you can become that uh, follower of Jesus. So in verse 26 and 27, you ask yourself, is that true of my life? If you don't hate your mother, father, you know, that if, if you don't, um, you know, pick up your cross, does that apply to your life? You know, are, have you gotten there? Listen, again, I hear it all the time. Like you see it in relationships. Well, he doesn't like to go to church. Well, she doesn't really care for a church. Well, we really can't find a good church. You, know, you hear all these things where people are divided, right? And, and, and they put that relationship before they do Christ. And that's not a follower of Christ, no matter how you slice it. Well, I don't talk to my kids about the Lord because, you know, they, you know how kids are. They don't really want to hear it. Well, live it out, walk it out, talk it out, sing it out, whatever. It, it needs to be in their lives, right? And so we it, to have a tendency to put earthly relationships above and beyond the relationship that Jesus wants with us. And when we get that relationship with him right, everything else falls into place. So, you know, we need to see uh, what it's like to, to consider to be a disciple. So again, in, in verse 25, if he says large crowds were going with him, those were huge crowds. And, the, and I bring this up to say that, you know, it's easy. I, I remember years ago when baby Christian time, and I was with this church and there was a, a, a some kind of split going on. And a couple of the key families, my close friends, went from that tiny little church that was splitting to this massive church. And I'm like, wow, it's such a difference. And they said, I just want to be a speck of dust. I don't want to know anything. I don't want to be a part of anything. I just kind of want to disappear and listen to the music and listen to the message. And unfortunately, you know what? That's a way of life for a lot of people. See, it's, it's, it's a lot easier going to a big church, just sitting there, big crowd, right? You can be inconspicuous. 
you never have that intimate time where people know what's going on in your life because you've shared it, obviously, where you're growing and discipling one another. You just kind of want to blend in. It's a whole lot easier to do that, isn't it? To just ride the wave, to ride that momentum, rah, rah, rah. I go to this big church. That's where everybody goes because it's a popular church, right? We do that. So the Lord understood here, again, that the, the crowd mentality was a very big part of what was going on. And, and there is a movement mentality. People want to be where people are. And that's what we're seeing. So again, I'm not criticizing your church, size your church or anything else. But I can tell you, it's very, it's, it's, it's I did it. Okay, it's possible to just be a speck of dust at a church. It's possible to not be involved. It's, to, it's possible to just be entertained and not grow. And so he wanted to get to the bottom of that. So, you know, in verse 25, they are growing and they are swelling. They're exploding, if you will. They're multiplying. But the Lord is not deceived just because the church gets bigger. Okay, he only... <laughs> only cares about the heart of his people. That's it. Not the size of the congregation, the heart of the people, which is why for us, like at the well, the focus is on, on just feeding sheep and loving sheep and, 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 and just growing that community because that's what he wants from each one of us. So it, salvation, it is a free gift without price or whatever price you could pay, but it requires that we come to a place of total, complete, radical submission and surrender to to um, our lives to him and give it all up according to our lord's words he cannot be my disciple so he's saying you know if you don't do this you can't be and so <laughs> i just appeal to each one of you to you know just to, to look inside your heart and to pray you know and to look at you know are, are you a true blood-bought follower of jesus or are you just an attendee of a church or just plug it in every once in a while this is a, a <laughs> this is a eternal uh, issue right where a lot of people just have not do not know that there is a difference but i i snagged this as i was preparing for this message and i just love this and uh, it talks about supreme devotion how beautiful is that to be supremely devoted to jesus so we have to love him more than anything or anyone else no competing affections you know where uh, you try to balance the ball you know how many people speaking of you know how many people uh do that where oh Johnny, church is important. Jesus is important, but uh, you've got a soccer tournament coming up, so we're not going to be in church for two. Take a stand, carry the cross, <laughs> you know, pay the price, right? So we have no competing allegiances. Jesus Christ has to be number one in your life. He will not tolerate any other position. And if he's not number one, you're not going to get in line to that, that to the highway to heaven, right? You, you, because you're not following him, and so it does come down to supreme devotion. And you know, if anyone, he says, if anyone, there aren't any exceptions. So to come to Christ is synonymous phrase for saving faith. If anyone, no exceptions, right? First John two three. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says I know him but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. Listen to that one more time. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. And so it's it's our it, it nourishes our soul, right? This is how we know that we are him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. And then verse 18, dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. It went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. So they weren't disciples, right? That's what he's saying. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. So he's, again, addressing the crowd, lots of people. Hey, we thought they were with us. We thought they were on board with us. We, you know, we thought so, but they're not. They weren't. So uh, finishing this sentence here, they were never disciples. But if you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. So, you know, there are things. If you love me, you keep my commands. And so he wants us to be obedient that way. Matthew chapter 10, 37 puts it this way. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I'll tell you, I, I think that women, especially mothers, oh boy, it's a tough one. You, you, you know, because you love your kids so much. God put that in you, right? That nurturing heart. It's a tough one. But it, it applies to us, too. You know, nobody can come before him. So when we break it down, the issue is who you love the most. You know, who, do you love yourself the most? Do you love your family the most? 
Do you tell yourself all the things that you deserve, right? Because you're such a good person. To love the Lord uh, is not merely feelings. It requires that totality, if you will. Pardon me one sec. It's down to, um, to your will. And Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. If you say you are, love Christ and you don't walk in obedience, it's just religious talk. And so many of us get caught in that trap. It's just a religious thing. So if you really love Jesus, your mind is inflamed, your heart is enlarged, and your will is engaged to commit your life, surrender your life, and trust your life to Jesus. And it's a decisive choice, right? It is, does come down to making that decision, but it is a way of life. So it encompasses your will. It encompasses your heart. It encompasses every part. So not all of Jesus' followers were able to make that commitment, were they? Remember when they said to him in John 6, I hate this because it's John uh, 6, 6, 6, right? But there were many who left Jesus after a while. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Why? Because they were saying, this is just too hard. You know, the, all this stuff, how am I going to give up and hate everybody? This is just too hard. And you know what? You may not see him. A physical removal of a lot of people, you know, where they turn back and were no longer following him. But you certainly see a spiritual thing. You know, we see that 52 percent of the people that quit going to church during COVID, they've never come back at all. It's hard to get people's attention to even get them into a church of any kind. Right. Look at this little following. It's hard to get them. There. So, you know, it, it's a matter of, you know, uh, the, the people left for a while. Maybe they never belonged. Uh, maybe after. All the COVID stuff, they just lost hope. I don't know what it is. But, you know, it's not the the masses that we see are not all heaven bound because he says narrow is the gate. And that what will separate us is this very teaching is, uh, you know, comes from Luke 14. So count the cost, guys. Listen, we, we can't afford to play games with this anymore. We can't afford to not look at the totality of our faith. Uh, it's not as simple as so Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. It's not that simple. He does love you. He laid down his life. But his, that the shed blood of Jesus, even though it's enough to cover every sin you ever did, never will. And for every generation, right, since the beginning of time, as he died for the sins of the world. But, you know, that doesn't apply to people who are followers. It, you know, it just doesn't apply. If you don't know Jesus, you know, that blood is not covering you. And so it's important that we count the cost. What does it look like? I was sharing this morning that years ago, um, you know, I was dating this very, very well-known musician. And, it, you know, he would fly me out here, fly me out there where he was. It was quite a lifestyle, by the way. Uh, but I would look at that and, and, and thank God for this, by the way, because a lot of people would just fall over for it. But I, I would look at it and think, you know, I, I can't be with this person. I, you know, it, it, I have to give up everything. I'd have to give up my privacy. I'd have to give up my freedom. I'd have to give up my career. I'd have to give up everything to be with this person. I counted the cost and it wasn't worth it. Praise God I didn't, right? Because, you know, all the things in that lifestyle, the, you know, every, uh, after a show, for instance, they would be in a suite and every, every surface in the suite had lines of cocaine. So what would it be to sell out for something like that, right? Praise God for the wisdom. I counted the cost and said, it's not, it is not going to fly. So we have to count the cost. There is a cost to being a follower of Jesus. But the point is that when we surrender and we love him, with every fiber of our being. It doesn't feel like it costs at all. It feels like the most amazing journey, the, the biggest honor and the biggest privilege in your life. In every relationship that you think, well, I might have to do it, everything just becomes more beautiful, right? Because he's first and he, he honors that in our lives. But to be a disciple, is, it comes with a cost, okay? That to, to see to eternity, it's gonna come with a cost. And so that's it for me, guys. Anybody have anything to share? Any two cents? Any something new that you've heard? You want to throw out there? I'm happy to talk about it. Deep okay. in thought, Lynn. Deep in thought. Oh. <laughs> Deep in thought. <laughs> there are so many things in my life that are right and so many things that are wrong. Mm -hmm. And you know, if the, I guess the first step is recognizing and then comes the hard part. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so just deep in thought.
Yeah, and I and I relate because it, you know it's the Holy Spirit. That's the good news. You know, if you can look at your life and say, well, there's so many things that aren't right. That's Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit guiding and convicting. But yeah, it's a daily journey for all of us. Die. I mean, we never master this thing. <laughs> you know, it's a daily journey. The heart wants to master it. The heart wants to to reach that point. But it's it's a it's a daily thing for each each of us. Take up our cross every day, right? It sure is. Thank you for that. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's it. Carol, you got a double dose of that. So hopefully, <laughs> whatever. I hope it blessed you uh, uh, the second time as much as it did the first time. And so I'm just so good to see you. And we lost Denise. I think her signal goes out. But you know what? This is uh, it's such a beautiful thing. I, I think back on, uh, it, I don't know how long ago it was now, but uh, David Boston was on and and he was talking about, you know, the recordings. And I said, well, you know, I, I record them, but they're only available to people who are, you know, with us here. And he said, oh, no big mistake. Put them out there. And it's beautiful to see the traction, these messages, you know, and it, it's just beautiful. And so, again, you know, uh, we can't be those proud people where we look at this and say, well, it's not worth it. Right. It's not worth it. Oh, no, no, no. It's always worth it. Wherever two or more gathered, it is worth it. But also, we don't know on this side of heaven the impact we've had with every word, with every prayer, with everything. We don't know. And so it's we just continue to do what the Lord would have us do. It's a beautiful thing. So let me close this down. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, we just love you so much, Lord. But I just, I'm so thankful. And it, the message that you burned into my heart really came from looking at a world so willing to pay a price, so willing to lay things down for such a small part of our lives, right? And, and and that just convicted me, Lord, as I looked at your word and said, what are you going to do? What is the price you pay? There is a price. There is a cost for the most beautiful gift, the most priceless gift that we, we to heaven bound, Lord, and it's so beautiful, we can't even wrap our heads around it because no eye has seen, no ear has heard. So, Lord, thank you for it. Thank you for penetrating my heart, for taking me to the woodshed and for giving me the words to, to share with my brothers and sisters in this journey of faith, Lord, that we might all be stronger, empowered disciples of Jesus Christ. In his mighty name we pray, amen. Thank you, guys. God bless you. You know where to find me. And I'll see you next time. Take care.